Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Soulful Hunter podcast. I am your host, Johnny Mack. Through this podcast, I'm on a mission to transform lives through primal adventure and to spread my mission of mentorship is conservation. This podcast is powered by Washington Backcountry, a resource for all hunters new and old. To find out more about Washington Backcountry, go to wabackcountry.com or search for Washington Backcountry on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Soulful Hunter podcast. Today, I got a wonderful episode for you, and it is a combination episode about pursuing your passions and specifically blacktail hunting and blacktail hunting. 101. So in uh, the Pacific Northwest, we have quite the man and just a wonderful individual who runs the website Pacific Northwest Bow Hunting, found at pnwbowhunting.com. His name is Tom Ryle, and he is like the blacktail master. He gives lots of seminars up here in the Northwest. And if you ever need to get some info on blacktail hunting, he's the man to go to. He helped uh, Jason, one of our previous guests on this episode, he helped him give uh, finally come across his first animal and it was a huge success. So Tom, has that is only one example of how much Tom has made an impact in this world. But we're also going to get into Tom's journey as... He has sacrificed careers and different things in his life to pursue his passion in in hunting and advocating for it for multiple generations to come. So we're going to talk about that. Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Johnny. It's uh, great to talk to you again. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it's always a great time when I get to talk with you. It's always a great time when you get to talk hunting and be with like-minded individuals. So thanks for joining us. You bet. So... Talk talk to the listeners. Take me through. I am brand new to hunting within the last five years. I have very little... I've had little success in actually hunting blacktail deer. It seems like you go out in the summertime, you can see does all over the place. It seems when you get into uh, hunting season, you see bucks in the cities. But then when you're actually out in the woods pursuing these animals, they're like ghosts and they just straight disappear. Take us through a little bit of how you fell into the love of blacktail hunting and and how you became so versed in hunting them. Okay. Um, Well, I think for me, you know, I grew up here in Washington State and, um, you know, grew up hunting and fishing with my dad and family. And the interesting thing was we never hunted on the west side. Uh, I used to hunt over out of Natchez and and, uh, kind of that highway 410 corridor up over chinook pass like all the stuff that's permit only elk areas now are areas that i grew up hunting elk and deer you know i'll be honest it didn't have a a lot of success over there um i think my dad took one four by four mule deer out of that country but you know at the end of the day it's it's heavily hunted and our hunting trips were an annual tradition but uh, you know i didn't see very much success and when i was in college you know, I was, I was, I, of course I'd seen blacktails all growing up and everything, but I never really considered hunting them much until I was in college. And it really came down to a necessity of what can I do to kind of extend my, my hunting season and opportunity. And, and ironically, that's, I guess, or, or coincidentally, more likely, that's how I got into archery. Because when I started looking at the archery seasons and seeing that I could not only hunt deer on the west side, but I could do it for a long time. Um, That was really attractive to me. So a little backstory there, but then, you know, fast forward into the foray of learning how to bow hunt and then do it on the west side with these black-tailed deer. Um, You know, I was just like everyone else. I didn't know really what I was doing. I had bought a used bow out of the newspaper, uh, figured it out, you know, had a buddy at work that, you know, showed me a few tips on shooting, but my gosh, um, you know, thanks for his patience, but probably learned a lot of bad habits. Um, and at the end of the day, it was just kind of spending my days tromping through the salal and the ferns and the big timber and the clear cuts, trying to figure out how to get within 15, 20 yards of one of these deer. And, um, uh, I, I started reading everything I could back then. I was a big student of, um, you know, Larry D. Jones and, and, and calling elk. And, and I was trying to figure out how to call deer at the same time. 
And so I, I started just getting into that and, and trial and error is how it started. And I got real lucky and I rattled in a really big buck for one of my buddies in college, uh, Mark, who actually was a little bit more seasoned archer and got me kind of squared away with some of my shooting and stuff called in a big buck that, that in a downpour, um, back then we shot these old inefficient bows and we shot with finger tabs and he had somehow hooked his finger tab or the, the piece of the leather was kind of hooked over his string and he released and his arrow came off his bow, just like a roller coaster. And I was like, what the heck happened? Well, this buck bolted, you know, and, and I ended up calling him back in, but he circled downwind and we didn't get a chance at him. But that, that kind of hooked me. Uh, and because they were on the West side, because I could hunt with a bow in areas where, you know, I didn't need to get clear out into some big timber tract or something, um, I could hunt locally and I could spend a lot more time in the woods observing and, and messing up and getting winded and just, you know, kind of getting immersed in it. And so that, that's kind of, for me, the frustration led to kind of fig- trying to figure out how to, how to figure out these deer and unravel kind of their secrecy and their weird nocturnal habits. And at the end of the day, it's been a long, a long time of continual learning and I'm, I'm still getting schooled every season. So it's, it, I wouldn't say I'm an expert. <laughs> well, you definitely know your material <laughs> and it is from an outsider's perspective. It's like, all right, this guy is confident in what he does and confidence speaks very loudly to people who have little experience. So, uh, that's something to really hang your hat on. So you got into, uh, learning how to call deer. So that's kind of like your main, main thing is what you hang your hat on is rattling in deer and, and hunting them during the rut. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've taken a number of deer in the early season and, and quite frankly, I, I love to interact with wildlife. So, um, as much as I don't mind sitting in a tree stand in September or spot and stock hunting, I would prefer to be hunting during the mating season in the pre-rut rut time frame when deer are out of that summer coat and they're in a more aggressive state and I have a better chance of, of creating a situation rather than just waiting for something to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a little more entertaining when you're out in the woods. Passes the time a lot quicker, I bet. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've I've spent time in tree stands from daylight till dark um, hunting whitetails. I've done it on blacktails. And that's a long time to sit in a little 18 by 24 inch platform. Right. Yeah, definitely. All right. So let's, let's talk, uh, tips, tactics, and just what to go about when you are pursuing blacktail, what is the very first thing you're looking for? How do you go about scouting an area, uh, whether e-scouting or actually putting boots on the ground? What is it that you're looking for when you're hunting blacktail? So what I'm looking for is mixed habitat of deciduous trees, clear cuts or feed areas, and kind of older growth, 50-year-plus growth, uh, evergreen stands of mixed hemlock and dug fir. Usually in those bigger stands, you get an understory or a a ground cover of, of ferns and a mix of ferns and salal. And I find that if I can find areas that bucks and uh, you know they love to to cruise that big timber during the pre-rut and rut but you know they need to be near security cover they need to be near feed and they don't want to travel long distances i mean it's all about efficiency so when i'm that's what i'm kind of looking for um i obviously look for limited access i look for pockets that might be landlocked by private land um i use tools like onyx maps um Google Maps, Google Earth. I use Bing Maps from Microsoft uh, because they have a bird's eye view feature that allows me to rotate around parcels. And sometimes you can find areas that they have imagery of multiple directions on that same image as opposed to a simple top down view. And um, I I use that on occasion, but um, Onyx Maps is my go to tool these days, mainly because I can look at land ownership. I can, you know, figure out access, uh, all that sort of stuff. 
Yeah, that is super awesome and good to know. It's a good little tip right there. When you are hunting, how big of a parcel of land are you trying to keep an eye on? Like, what what type of movement do you expect out of blacktail? Are they pretty local and centralized, or are they migrating or traveling, or what do you look for? Well, that's that's a that's a big question, quite frankly, because it depends on a number of things. It depends on the elevation. It depends on the local habitat and infrastructure around that, whether it be roads, developments, highways, easements, waterways, rivers. So you got to look at the landscape as a kind of a puzzle and each puzzle piece, um, however you want to break that down, can be shaped in a different way and have natural barriers or corridors or things that essentially, um, you know, influence deer movement and patterns. So one thing about blacktails is they're very much like a whitetail in the fact that they're very adaptable, which is why you do see all these city bucks and, you know, deer. Um, I had a job here where I, I worked in town and every October I could count on seeing a buck come right down the street, literally down the sidewalk, um, <laughs> cruising. And every October for three years in a row, a buck did that. And, so they're going to do what they do, and they're very adaptable. But as far as what I look for, I will look for if I can get access to 5 or 15 or 30 acres that borders uh, a strip that's 100 acres or 200 acres or uh, gets me backed up to uh, timber company land that I can't hunt or you know anything like that, I try to look at how do I build a puzzle that – gets me near or adjacent to or on a uh, habitat that's going to hold deer. And every local deer population is going to have its own little dynamic. So you got to kind of figure that out and reverse engineer the number of does in the area and the competition for those does during the rut. And, you know, the myriad of, uh, excuse me, influences that you have to kind of start piecing together. And the only way to do that is to spend time with those animals and observe and, you know, take notes and mark up maps and just start building out as much intelligence as you can. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's really uh, interesting perspective. A lot of the times, like when I first got into hunting, it was taking a look at where is public land. And then if I can hike in a logging road or ride a bicycle I pretty much was sticking to clear cuts and like the type of information that I was reading was like, you know, hunt the fringe of the clear cut or about what, 30 right. yards into the taller timber. Is that kind of mm-hmm. a rule of thumb that you follow as well? Yeah, I mean, it definitely, that's all good advice. I think any, you know, they're, they're creatures of edges, right? They're like, they love edge habitat, much like a whitetail. And, you know, another thing I, I look for is natural funnels and travel routes I think with with animals, especially when you're hunting animals during the rut, and you know hunting elk during the rut is different than hitting, hunting deer during the rut in that the deer will use their noses on the ground much more methodically than an elk will try to, you know, you watch elk, you know, they're they're more of a their nose is four and a half five feet off the ground, um, whereas a deer they're constantly putting their nose to the ground, they're they're smelling the the inner digital gland scent of the deer that walk down that trail, they're, they're picking up all those, those ground level cues. I use funnels and I use the efficiency of the terrain to, uh, to my advantage and thinking like, you know, how would a buck move through this area fastest and get the most scent, uh, checking out of it. So if it's, you know, moving downwind into a big stand of timber, you know, 30 yards inside the edge of a cut that's very exposed, you're going to have a higher probability of seeing a buck back in that security cover than you are out in the open. Um, so I think, you know, using those edges, using funnels and features to, to think like a buck in a sense of where would a buck go to stay hidden yet still most efficiently check for, you know, receptive does in those areas. Yeah. Okay. So talking about that, moving into rub lines, what is a rub line? 
why are they important? Does it only matter during the rut? And do you specifically search and look for those for the when you're hunting corridors, or or what is it that? Well, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot written about rubs, and and a lot of it, albeit, is written about whitetails and rub behavior and whitetails. But I guess for me, rubs do play a pretty important role in my scouting and locating areas that. Uh, are holding bucks during a time of year when they are rubbing trees. Um, most of the rubbing they do in September, uh, late August, early September, when they're getting rid of velvet off their antlers, they're using, uh, you know, more whippy, brushy kind of vegetation that they can really work that velvet off their antlers. Um, whereas when they're working on their pre-rut, uh, you know, gearing up for the mating season, they're going to be, that's when they're going to be laying down rubs that you might see on everything from saplings up to two to five to eight to 10 inch trees, depending on where you're at. And, and I found that they generally prefer obviously a soft bark tree. Um, I have found a few good rubs on cherry trees, but by and large, they're going to be on these, these, I think they're kind of like a black willow or something. Um, they're, they're a willow species that deer are just blacktails, especially are just, they're like magnets. In fact, when I move through areas, if I don't find those trees are rubbed, I usually don't find many bucks in those areas. So it's kind of an indicator species of tree that if there are bucks in the area, they're going to hit those trees. And I think that they, they're easy for them to mark up. Um, the bark turns bright orange. And uh, so it's a good visual cue for does and other passing deer. And I think they're able to leave their scent on that bark when it gets all frayed. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's pretty impressive looking on those trees when, they, when they're fresh. Yeah, that's pretty cool. This, this fall, but, when I was out running and I was running a trail out here in Snohomish, I came across a rub line of like, Oh man, probably 12 trees in bushes in a row just rubbed and torn apart and it was super fresh. And I was like, man, this is so impressive, but I never actually saw any deer in the area when I was out, uh, in that, in that zone. Yeah. So yeah. And back to your question on rub lines. So generally what'll happen is, um, you know, the rub, a rub line will usually indicate number one direction of travel. So if you see four, six, eight, ten rubs in a, in a row that, you know, maybe it's over the course of a hundred yards or something. Um, and you notice all those rubs are on the same side of a tree, um, that will give you an indication of what direction those deer are traveling. And, and usually for me, I look at that and I think, okay, I'll, I'll zoom out on a map and say, okay, where is there a bedding area at the end of this? Is there a feed area at the end of this? Where is the destination point? And, um, you know, I kind of try to keep track of that, but I don't hunt over rubs. And I think that's a mistake people tend to make. If they find a bunch of fresh rubs, they want to put up a tree stand and, and wait for those bucks to come back and refreshen up those rubs. But it's, it's really a low percentage, uh, hunt in my experience. And the reason for that is most of those rubs are made at night. And secondly, a, a mature buck or a breeding buck in the peak of the pre-rut will lay down, you know, dozens of those rubs um, in a 24-hour period all over the place. So um, you can be kind of looking for a needle in a haystack and, and one that's actually pretty nocturnal at that. So I generally try to look at the bigger picture of, where's the nearest doe, uh, population, where's the, the resident doe hangout or the feed area, where's the nearest bedding area. And, and what I find is most of those core rub areas are in, uh, pretty brushy stuff and, and next to, or adjacent to swamps or ravines or, um, a lot of underbrush where they can mm. be in a secure spot. And they rather hold up tight rather than run away like a mule deer. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and they are very, very much like that. They'll use the cover to their advantage. They're more apt to sit tight and even lay down uh, and let you move past. Or what they, a classic example is they like to kind of move off 
and then they'll circle behind you. Um, and so I spend a lot of time looking back over my shoulder when I move through areas because I've caught bucks that are actually doing a, a kind of a U, a J loop behind me. And, uh, they do that to come back and scent, tra- scent check the trail or, you know, maybe they didn't see me. They just heard me and, uh, you'll, you'll oftentimes catch them coming around the back. That is really good advice. See right there. If you can't get anything out of this podcast, check your, check <laughs> over your shoulder when you're hunting for blacktails. That's, I really like that. But take me into terrain because I know in Western Washington, in the lower foothills, it's a lot of rolling hills. And typically when you're hunting uh, mountainous terrain, you know, you got your South side has the feed, the North side has the beds. How is it? And what do you see from experience of, of how the blacktails move or, or where you end up finding them at most of the time? Well, that's a, brings up a larger topic of really the home range of blacktails and, And essentially, you know, what we're talking about or what I typically hunt are what I would call like valley floor uh, type deer. And these are deer that are kind of up and down the I-5 corridor. They're not out in the high peaks of the coast range or the foothills of the Cascades. Um, However, those areas are chock full of blacktails. And, you know, if you're moving east, you know, you get up into that packwood and and kind of that elevation, uh, below white pass and then follow that along, you know, parallel along the cascade range. You know, a lot of times those bucks are, are, uh, intermingling with mule deer and you can get some cross breeding happening, but going out to the West, you know, West of I five, those are, those are pure, you know, Colombian black tailed deer that are not intermingling with mule deer you know, these, these deer will operate differently in different habitats naturally because they're adaptable. So, um, when I'm in the foothills, I'm, I'm pretty much the foothills you would treat just like you would a deer at sea level, except you've got some elevation gain. So deer tend to like to go uphill to bed. They like to bed essentially just off the crest of a bench or uh, some sort of feature and they like to look down uh, and, and have the wind at their back, and that gives them a quick escape cover if they need to or an escape route to, to drop down in elevation quickly. Um, but it, really, it's, 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 it all comes down to scouting and figuring out how the deer are moving through the area that you're, you're trying to hunt. Man. So you know, I walk, walk a lot of trails in the off-season. Yeah, just kind of start looking for tracks and uh, look for food and, and bedding areas, huh? Yeah, and I, you know, I've written, I've talked about this at, at nauseum. I feel like sometimes, but I wrote a, a series on postseason scouting. Um, I need to get that republished on my new website, but it's it's really a, an in depth approach to how I uh, how I do my scouting and how I do my preparation for the fall, and it really starts right now. You know, our late archery season just ended and, and it's game on. Like I have no problem plowing into bedding areas and, you know, finding and mapping every shed, every bed, every trail, every piece of information I can start gathering now, because what it tells me is where the deer are or were at the, at the, at the tail end of the season and the black tail rut really effectively goes right through December. And, and that so, starts like pre-rut is like Halloween and then the, the heavy rut ends in what November and then goes all the way through December is what you're saying? Yeah. You end up with kind of a second estrus cycle for, for the stragglers that didn't come in or yearlings that didn't come in during that mid November period, 28 days later, they come back into estrus and um, you know, there's a lot fiercer competition for those fewer breeding does available. Um, but generally, you know, for me, it's, yeah, the, the, the velvet comes off. Just if you're looking at big picture stuff here, the velvet's off by September 1st, you know, by mid October, you got a lot of young teenage bucks running around chasing deer around broad daylight. And then you get down to that last week in October, I'm rattling, I'm calling. And that's when I'm, I'm really looking to find a bruiser but it may not happen until that late uh, archery, or excuse me, late rifle season uh, that kicks in in that four-day late season in November. 
um, that's, those are magic four days. If you can be in the woods, man, I w- tried to get in the woods for that time this year, but I just didn't have an opportunity to, but it's definitely something I'm looking at pursuing next year. Are you focusing more on rattling or are you focusing on uh, a doe bleat or sense? What, what is your, I mean, obviously you probably have a giant bag of tricks, but what is, what do you rely on mostly? Yeah, it is a it is a, a bag of tricks, and it's oftentimes futile. To be perfectly honest with you, um, you know, I, I've had success using all of those methods that you mentioned numerous times, but my go to is a a soft doe bleat, and and again, it's a social call. It's not an aggressive call, and it's never going to alert or scare deer away. Uh, I shouldn't say never because you never know with deer, but. Um, in general, it's not a threatening call. So I'm not afraid to use it and use it a lot throughout the day. And when you use that call, when bucks are most keyed in on trying to find a receptive doe, I've called more bucks in with that doe bleat, a really soft doe bleat call than any other method combined. And And so how often are you blowing that thing? I will blow that thing. Um, again, I'm blowing it very softly and and I think that's another uh, maybe refinement that I've learned over the years. Is I used to, you know, I bought a deer grunt call, and in you know, uh, you listen to some of those calls, and and they're they're loud. You know, it's a really abrupt sound. And this particular call, I modified. I sanded the soundboard on the call, and I changed the reed to a thinner mylar reed. And um, it's just a real soft, sweet doe bleat. And because it's so soft, I will blow this thing four to six times, uh, at any one location. But if I move 30 yards, 40 yards, I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to keep doing that. And, um, because I know that with the vegetation, um, I could be standing behind a a wall of thick cedar trees and deer a hundred yards away. aren't going to hear me if I step around those trees and blow on it again, now I might get their attention. So it's, it's a close range, uh, tool. And, um, but I, it's just been absolutely really effective for me. Man, that's, that's good to know. I think when I was using my call this, this fall for the very brief moment I got out there, I think it might've been too loud. So that's good, good advice right there. Yeah, so, and, and I'll, let me say one more thing here. So I, I've hunted whitetails um, uh, across the Midwest, and I was in my stand in Kansas one day, and it was about 11 o'clock in the morning, and, and it was just sunny in October, and I was thinking, man, this is just terrible. There's nothing going on. And I got rocked out of my tree stand by the loudest grunt I've ever heard, and I thought, what, what was that? And it, this... 140 class eight pointer comes out of this CRP right next to me. And I'm just going, Holy smokes. And if I wouldn't have seen that, I wouldn't have believed that was a deer that made that sound. Um, so, you know, it's not to say that black tails won't grunt loudly. I've watched bucks trailing does. I've shot bucks at 10 yards that were hot on a doe grunting the whole time. And even then it's very soft. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my general assessment is that black tails vocalizations are uh, dramatically softer than those of white tails that I've experienced. Interesting. Well, I know my buddy Tony, he's my hunting partner. He actually, his first uh, deer that he shot was a black tail buck on Halloween during modern rifle season. And he didn't, he was on his way out. It was uh, pouring rain. It was getting dark. Uh, almost shooting hours were over. And on his way out, a buck actually grunted at him. And that's what got his attention. He looked up and he found it and then it started running off and he took a shot and, and dumped it. But but uh, it's really interesting that <laughs> it was like the deer actually called out to him to be shot. Yeah, I mean, it, they do get aggressive. And if they, he may have heard your buddy coming through the brush and wanted to put out a, essentially a warning that, hey, you know, this is my turf. And maybe he had a... Maybe he had a doe nearby that he was tending and was trying to, you know, keep him, keep your buddy away. But yeah, I mean, they're, 
they are they are a different animal during the mating season. I think that's what makes them so enticing and and fun uh, species to hunt because they they're very challenging. But you you know every year I learn so much. Uh, I learned this year what not to do. Um, <laughs> you know I <laughs> sometimes you know you think well one more day in the stand and it's going to happen and then you you know then the season's over and and you realize that you maybe over hunted a stand or you, they were tipping you, you were tipping them off on your way into a stand or whatever it might be. But, um, I didn't hunt much this, this fall because I dislocated my shoulder and been trying to heal up. And, but I did get out for a few days of late archery and, and it was really nice to just turn my bow down and, and, and go and sit in the ground blind and, and hope for, hope for something to happen. Um, uh, I had some, some younger bucks just send me into fits because I couldn't figure out how to unravel these guys. And it was on a property I'd never been on before and some state land and I just didn't have them figured out. And, and even these, you know, small two and three point bucks were just laughing at me all the way to the end of the season. (laughs) Yeah. It can, it's, well, that's why they call it hunting, not killing, right? It's, that's uh, right. It's a challenge. Yep. All right, so let's transition a little bit. We got a lot of the blacktail tactics down, and that's something that I've wanted to personally have a conversation with uh, and talk about because this next year I see myself really dialing and hitting that hard. It's really nice being living in western Washington to not have to go too far from home and still be in quality blacktail habitat. So, yeah. but let's transition out of that. One thing when I introduced you at the beginning of this episode was that you are the, the, the guy behind Pacific Northwest bowhunting.com. But what I didn't share is what you do as a career now. So for those listeners out there, Tom is just, he, he has a huge heart and he decided that that he he had to uh, speak up and pursue his passion, and it ended up switching careers. But I don't want to tell the story since we have you here, Tom. And so, tell us what you did last year. What what was your reasoning, and what you're doing now, and and why why you're so motivated to do it and following your purpose? Sure. Uh, well, uh, I guess the the longer backstory is that I. I I've always, I grew up in Washington hunting and fishing, and it's always been a, a deep passion of mine. And I've done a lot of work, volunteer work, and uh, for Oregon Foundation for Blacktail Deer. I helped start a Rocky Mountain Oak Foundation chapter in Bellingham when I was in college, the uh, Mount, ba- Mount Baker chapter that's still going up there. Um, and then I've just, you know, done a lot of volunteer work with, with the state, with fish and wildlife and whatnot. And, um, but all the while I was pursuing, uh, my career in product design and development. And I did that for a long, long time. And essentially it led to, um, you know, a career where I was, I got back into consulting and, um, and department of fish and wildlife was one of our clients for a complete and complete redesign of the entire website, which meant completely re-architecting and rebuilding the entire website from scratch. And, uh, in doing that and having the department of uh, fish and wildlife as my client, uh, yeah, I met a number of people and, and some of the leadership there. And, and I just really felt like, you know, with my past and a lot of the things that I had done with the agency over the years, hunter ed instructor, things like that. Um, it, it just seemed like an opportunity to, to maybe refocus my, my passion and my career in one place. And so an opportunity arose, uh, to, to head up the sales and marketing team, uh, for the agency. And so, uh, that's what I've been doing for the last year. And, uh, it's been, it's been really, really eye opening now as an employee of, of an agency that quite frankly gets a lot of a bad press out there. Um, but, but being on the inside, it's really interesting to see how little authority the agency has to make some of the decisions that people think the agency should be making. Um, you know, we have a governor appointed wildlife commission, we have the legislature and we have a lot of vocal, uh, hunters and fishermen out there that, that influence all of that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's challenging, but it's, it's also very eye opening and, 
And for me, it's an opportunity to, to really get involved and try to make the agency uh, the best it can be for Washingtonians. And then additionally, it's just my passion in trying to mentor and help bring in the next generation of conservationists in this state. Um, whatever I can do to, to move that forward is, is kind of what I, where I want to put my, my heart and soul. That is so cool. Well, one thing that you, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one thing that you did that uh, impacted me and all the lives of a lot of people up in the Snohomish County was you were the one who talked to me about the NASP program. So being a school teacher and a, a phys ed teacher, I didn't know that there is grants to be able to get archery in schools. And so right. you already made a huge impact in my life and then all, the lives of all my students because this year was the first year we were able to teach archery in, in all our uh, middle school classes at our school. And kids have absolutely loved it. And it's been amazing to see the growth and the excitement that, that these students have found in trying something brand new. That is fantastic to hear. And, yeah, the National Archery in Schools program is, is phenomenal. Um, people can Google it and see how many states and countries that program is in now. And then the sister project or, or brainchild of one of the founders of, of NASP um, started this Scholastic 3D Archery Association, and that is the sort of outdoor 3D hunting kind of uh, flavor of, of NASP. And so where National Archery and Schools program is about indoor, uh, you know, paper targets, gymnasiums, big tournaments, super awesome there's now another uh, kind of avenue for kids to, to take their NASP experience, take it outside and, and start shooting 3D courses and doing more field archery, uh, you know, experience. So both programs are phenomenal. I'm really happy to hear that you actually were able to make that happen. Congrats to you for that. Yeah, thank awesome. you. I appreciate that. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, really made an impact in my community. Uh, a lot of my fellow teachers were actually kind of shocked. Um, they're a little resistant also is that some people who are not familiar with with archery or even going that side, you know, considering it the, the weapon and I don't know if I want to teach that. You right. know, and so you, you deal with the fear factor of people and the and the barriers that hold people back from being able to find fulfillment and enjoyment and also passing on that towards, you know, the next generation. Right. I agree. And, and it is interesting. And I think there are a lot of stigmas out there that need to be debunked. You know, if you look at archery, you look at even guns and shooting sports, the injuries and, and uh, you know, uh, statistics around that are far, far less than, you know, organized youth football or, or many other sports for that matter. Right. And not to knock any of those sports, I think team sports are fantastic, but there's a lot of kids out there that don't want to play team sports. And the beauty of archery is it is an individual sport. You can be part of an archery team or an individual. And, and there's just something about drawing an arrow back and, and putting all your concentration in that shot and, and then releasing that arrow. Um, you know, it's, it's a solitary endeavor. And for a lot of kids, it's what they've been looking for, but didn't know was available to them. Yeah. Yeah. I, we just got back from winter break and I wanted to ask all my students if any of them asked for the holidays for a bow, but I haven't gotten a chance to, to do that yet. But so we're going to, we're going to find out and, and try to spark that fire a little bit more. The next step that I want to do as a, a teacher is get some type of, whether it's a pellet gun or even I know back in the day there used to be 22 clubs at uh, mm -hmm. their different schools. But I want to get some type of firearm safety and course or whether not just firearm but pellet gun or BB gun. Mm -hmm. But some type of shooting course to reduce the fear factor and, you know, knowledge is power, right? People right. would be afraid of driving cars if they weren't taught driver's ed. The same th concept is you, you have, we have all these people who can vote who are afraid of weapons, but yet they've never actually learned how to use one. So knowledge is power, and then you can make an informed decision based off of that. And, and that's, I think, one of the, the next steps that I'm going to be trying to pursue in my school district. 
Yeah, and you might look down here uh, in the South Sound area. I know my my kids go to Tumwater High School, and they have a, a nationally ranked uh, rifle team. And my daughter shot on that team, uh, well, I think freshman, sophomore year. But they've had a couple of their students go on to the Olympics um, in shooting. So the faculty is very steeped in all of the the procedures, and they've got they've got it dialed. So if you want to to reach out to Tumwater High School, I'm sure they could get you the information you're looking for. But I would I would agree with you there. I think that you know I think anyone who's in in the shooting sports uh, fields, whether it's competitive or you're a hunter, um, you know we all have a job to do, I think, to educate people and, and, and not make this about, um, us and them, but, uh, you know, there's just a lot of, the internet is a very noisy place and there's a lot of information out there that's wrong. And I think that as a result, we, we kind of owe it to, uh, these, these activities to speak up and, and help correct people in a respectful way. Um, and just sort of debunk some of those myths out there because I would argue that, you know, I grew up and went to Hunter Ed when I was 12 and, and I had my own shotgun when I was 12 and I worked at the gun club in high school and, and pulled trap in the evenings. And, you know, there was not one injury. There was not one fatality. There was not one mishap in, in all those years. And, and it's because people who are trained in firearm safety respect you know, the, the danger that's associated with, with being, uh, you know, irresponsible with a firearm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's just that simple. Yeah. It's, uh, it's sad to see so many people that are fearful and live life with fear controlling their decisions that are then voting on the public policies that really affect our every day-to-day life, not just the Second Amendment and gun control, but then carry that over into the hunting world and what you do with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, like you mentioned earlier, is that you really don't have as much uh, control as what people think you do because it's opened up to this public forum. And then you have people that live in cities that are making decisions that are impacting people on the other side of the state in in country that that is just it's not the same. So, can you speak into that a little bit as far as what you see from someone who's new in the department and what it's like transitioning from the private sector to the public sector? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I you know I aside from uh, eight years of Naval Reserve. Uh, you know, uh, service. I had never worked for the government or state before I'd, I'd consulted to a number of state agencies. So I had a a pretty good indication of kind of how their funding works and some of the the barriers and bureaucracy involved, um, in a government organization, but certainly, uh, you know, clipping on a badge and going to work and then simple things like, um, Oh, oh, this would be a cool idea if we just did this, or why don't we sell this? You know, we get all these people wanting to buy this from us. Well, there's state laws that say we can't sell things, right? Or there's state laws that say we can't advertise for something, or we can't ask for a donation. Or um, it's it's really interesting how the RCWs and WACs <laughs> control everything and literally everything about what we do. Um, and then of course all the policies. So I'm, I'm actually very new. I've only been there a year. I'm learning every day a lot. Uh, so I'm certainly no authority and I certainly don't want to misspeak here, but for me, just being an individual moving from, you know, 25 years in the private sector, working for, you know, large tech companies and, and whatnot, uh, going to a government agency, it's, it's certainly a shock. I'm used to things moving much faster. I'm used to decisions being made like today, not in a month. Um, but I also fully understand and see the implication and, and sort of all of the moving parts around decision making and that we serve every resident in Washington. And so you've got to have public meetings. You've got to have, uh, you know, reviews with the commission. Um, you've got, in, in certain cases here, we've had the govern, governor himself intervening with some of our 
our wolf policy stuff. And, and so these things are not trivial and it's not about my opinion or someone else's opinion. It's about representing the entire state of Washington. And we've got a very fast growing state. Um, we're the fourth fastest growing state in the country. And as a result, uh, last time I checked, we were not making more habitat. So when you put that many more people on the landscape, and then you've got, you know, wolves migrating into our state and moving west. Um, all of these things are huge uh, public concerns, right? And within that, we've got federal policy, state policy, state laws. There's things there that I don't pretend to know all the details of uh, because, quite frankly, it's not my job responsibility. Um, I'm in the kind of more public facing side of the agency with, with marketing and outreach. But that being said, I'm getting smarter and working with some of those folks who are in that space. And, uh, it's really eye opening. Um, there's a lot of people at that agency that work tirelessly to try to get these things resolved for, you know, the best outcome possible. And, uh, at times I feel like if we could just, if we could just be as transparent and, and as I would want, um, I think we would win a lot of people over, but I think when you're, when you're trying to be transparent, you're also, you're also opening yourself up to more uneducated uh, criticism. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. And so right. I, it's a, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough job. I'll put it that way. Yeah. And I think that the people who are at that agency that I know and work with on a daily basis, man, they get up every day and they are dedicated to doing the best work they can. And, and that's one of the things that I really love seeing is, you know, I, I see a lot of the negative comments here and there on certain issues and I just got to roll my eyes. Like you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, it's tough. I talk about this on this uh, podcast quite a bit about having a perspective versus an opinion. Um, I, there's a lot of people will just throw out what they think without truly knowing what it's like in that situation and having an experience. So, yeah, I think that's very important that you're talking about that. One thing I want to hear about what Fish and Wildlife is doing and whatnot is what type of community outreach are they doing? Are they trying to start, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Like councils or public opinion boards and, and how do people get involved with this? Yeah. Well, you know, if you go to our website, we have, we have in our about us, um, links and, uh, at the bottom of the page or in the main menu there, there's, there's a get involved section and there's, we have public meetings and we have, um, a number of advisory groups that uh, are out there that people can uh, try to get involved in. I know, uh, I think the Wolf Advisory Group, uh, they're looking at, I believe they're looking to get folks from the hunting community involved in participating in some of those groups so that the voice of, of hunters in our state are recognized uh, at those at those forums, uh, which we certainly have now. But going forward, if we, if we start looking at things like post recovery and and all of that, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities for people to to get involved. You know, public meetings we have those schedules. Um, really, those are the best ways that I can think of. Um, but then we, you know what I do a lot of in our hunter ed department. Uh, works on is a lot of mentored and outreach events, mentored hunts for pheasant, turkey. Um, I would like to see us expand some of those opportunities. Uh, so I've been, um, that's on my radar. And then we do a lot of what we call kind of one-on-one events where we will have, you know, like a squid fishing one-on-one event at Point Defiance Marina. And we've done that a few times now and families come down and we got it's fantastic. We have donated jigs and we had tell people how to get set up and people can come out and, and learn how to jig for squid. We do that with salmon. We do that with steelhead. Um, we've done it with, uh, crappie, uh, 
which is, you know, a lot of people don't even know we have much crappie fishing and we've got, um, just a ton of opportunities in this state. And what we're trying to do, my team is really trying to do is, is make people aware of all these opportunities and, and show people how to get involved and do it on their own. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, good. And, and, and thank you for pursuing your passion and living out what you actually believe. So it's important to see you doing that. And it sets a great example for everyone else as well. Yeah, well, it's, 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 uh, again, it's a lot of work, but it's so rewarding when you can go to an event and you can hear from somebody or a mom, you know, so, you know, this is the best, my kid just told me this is the best day they've had all year. And you think, wow, that's pretty cool. You probably hear that more as a teacher than I do in my jobs, but, (laughs) 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 uh, you know, it, it's, it is quite rewarding when you can share the outdoors with somebody and, and hopefully there's a spark there that will keep them going for a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, Tom, thank you so much for coming on and being a part of this uh, episode. Is there any final thoughts that you'd like to add or share or how can people get a hold of you? Uh, I know you run a great website or where are you at on social media? Yeah, I mean, I guess I got lucky with my name because uh, nobody had Tom Ryle. So if you find me on Facebook, it's Tom Ryle. If it's on Twitter, it's Tom Ryle. It's on Instagram, it's Tom Ryle. Um, I've even got a portfolio website out there, TomRyle.com. But my my hunting site is pnwbowhunting.com. Um, I used to. Some people know I used to have a business called Fresh Tracks Outdoors. Um, I used to write for a number of industry publications and such. A lot of that content, unfortunately, it was not able to get migrated to my new site. So um, I'm, I'm kind of trying to work on that. But with the job change, I haven't updated my site as much as I'd have liked. Um, I do have a number of articles I'll be posting here about postseason scouting. Um, if anyone wants to get a hold of me, there's a contact form on my website and uh, I've got a number of blog posts up there. There's some top tips and tactics for blacktails. If you haven't seen that, you can go check that stuff out. But, um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I love helping people. And I, I'm, again, no expert, but I've tried to share everything I've learned just to try to carve off some years off somebody's learning curve. And, you know, Jason, you talked about his story that was the best part of my entire season this year was seeing him finally tag that buck and what a buck it was. Yeah. Absolute tank of a blacktail. So it was yeah. pretty awesome to see. Yeah. So, so no, that's it. But uh, I love it. Well, Tom, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me tonight and being a part of the Soulful Hunter podcast. Make sure to go check out Tom's website, find him on Instagram, social media, reach out. He is an amazing ambassador and advocate for hunting and someone who is always willing to go the extra mile, which I have found personally in my own life. And it's hard to come by people like that in this world. So, Tom, thank you so much for being on the Soulful Hunter podcast. And uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, hey, thank you. I appreciate the kind words and uh, look forward to working with you here in the future on some stuff. And, uh, yeah, just reach out if you want to uh, talk to me about anything. Heck, yeah, I love it. All right, everybody. Remember, mentorship is conservation and hunting has the power to transform your lives through primal adventure. So as always, I'm Johnny Max. Stay soulful. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I'd love it if you could go ahead and give this a rating as well as subscribe. Also, you can check us out on Instagram under the Soulful Hunter podcast. Make sure to tag us in pictures and posts and use the hashtag Soulful Hunter. To find out more about the Soulful Hunter podcast, go to soulfulhunter.com. And be sure to follow the podcast as we are going to be bringing you a lot of great information, insight, and changing lives through Primal Adventure. I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Stay tuned and stay soulful.